بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم رب الشرح لي صدري وسر لي أمري وأحل الأقضة من لساني يفقه قولي آمين اللهم صلي على سيدنا محمد الفاتح لما أغلق والخاتم لما سبق ناصر الحق بالحق والهادي إلى سراتك المستقيم وعلى آله حق غدره ومقتاره العظيم اللهم افتح علينا فتوح العارفين وقوة فقنا توفيق الصانحين وانفعنا اللهم بالقرآن والذكر الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزلنا علما وعملا متقبلا بوجهك الكريم يا أرحم الراحمين الحمد لله سو so, uh, Ramadan is nearly upon us, alhamdulillah, again this year in uh, a little bit over a week now, inshallah. Um, today we'll be talking about the purpose of fasting, so not so much about the rulings of fasting. Um, inshallah, most people already know that or um, uh, uh, are able to find um, a means to review that or to learn that if they don't already know it. But as everything in our deen, our deen isn't just ahkam, it's not just rulings, it's not just law. Everything in the religion has a purpose. And so when we, uh, when we learn fiqh, when we learn the, the rulings of uh, fasting, when we learn the rulings of prayer, when we learn the uh, rulings of going on hajj, a lot of times these things can feel arbitrary. It's um, for many people, Oh, uh, following religion feels like there's minefields everywhere and you just have to navigate around the minefields and people will tell you where to go. So long as you avoid certain things, you're all good. You're all good with God and then eventually in the afterlife you'll get your reward. But that's not really what, what religion is. That's uh, someone who's doing the, the bare minimum. But it's not what the vision of Islam is. It's not what the vision of what Allah intends for us is. And so you see uh, in, in the Quran many uh, uh, instances where, or, yes, there are uh, ayat, there are hadith about the rulings uh, pertaining to uh, our ibadat and, and, and pertaining to our actions and to our converse and so on and so forth. But there are also verses related really to the purposes of them as well. And so, and so, for example, salah, prayer, Allah says about it, وَأَقِيمُ الصَّلَاةَ لِذِكْرِ Establish a prayer for my remembrance. So yes, in the prayer there's a standing and sitting and bowing and uh, there's a certain amount of, of, um, of ayat that have to be recited after the Fatiha. There's a certain length of time that they should stay in the sitting position, etc. Those are all rulings, but all of those rulings, all that form, it's built towards a specific function. That function is, أَقِيمُ الصَّلَاةَ لِذِكْرِ let that prayer be for my remembrance. Uh, in, in Hajj, Allah reveals, إِنَّ الصَّفَى وَالْمَرْوَةَ مِنْ شَعَائِرِ اللَّهِ فَمَنْ حَجَّ الْبَيْتَ أَوْ اَعْتَمَرَ فَلَا جِنَاهَ عَلَيْهِ أَنْ يَطَّوَّفَ أَبِهِمَا He says, verily, Safa and Marwa are from the symbols of, of Allah. And so whoever visits the house of Allah uh, in Hajj or, or, or on, on Umrah, then he must do tawaf, which is literally like a circling back and forth, whether it's the back and forth of, uh, of Safa and Marwa or the literal circling of the Kaaba. Then he must do tawaf uh, regarding those two. And so the purpose here is sha'ar. This is a symbolic ritual. We're uh, following the footsteps of our, um, our father Ibrahim and going through this act of pure ibadah. Right, Allah says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّةِ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I didn't create a jinn or mankind except to worship me. And so part of the purpose of, of Hajj and Umrah is for the intellect to do sajda. It's part of the purpose that there's a lot of rituals that we don't understand. And it's the fact that we do ibadah anyways. We come to Allah in a state of labbaik, at your service putting the head down and not asking questions. That's part of the purpose of Hajj. Uh, the purpose of, of, of Zakat is twofold. One, one comes in Hadith and one comes in, in an Ayah. One is to remove the, um, the quality of stinginess from, from the heart. And the other one is for a, 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 re a redistribution of wealth and a recognition that those who are poor aren't just poor because they haven't worked hard enough. Uh, a lot of times, um, 
you know, this this is what Allah has apportioned for for different people. Some people are fortunate, and so they they become more wealthy. Some are less fortunate, and so they're poor. And so the Prophet sallallahu says in a hadith, فَأَخْبِرْهُمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ قَدْ فَرَضَ عَلَيْهِمْ صَدَقَةً تَخَذُوا مِنْ أَغْنِيَائِهِمْ فَتُرَدُّوا عَلَى فُقَرَائِهِمْ Tell them that Allah has obligated on them sadaqa, obligated upon them a charity, to be taken from the rich amongst them and to be returned, meaning it wasn't actually theirs to begin with, to be returned to the poor amongst them. And so that brings us to psalm, that brings us to fasting. What then is the purpose of fasting? All these rulings that we learn about fasting, what's its aim, what's the function uh, that it serves? And so Allah says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu kutiba alaykum as siyam kama kutiba ala ladheena min qablikum la'allakum tattakun. Yeah. So fasting was, O oh, you who believe fasting was, was prescribed on you just as it was prescribed for those before you so that you might gain piety, which is a poor translation of taqwa. What taqwa means is to uh, create a shield, a wiqaya, before you and around you on all sides. And this comes from the uh, literal meaning of som. Uh, som in Arabic comes from, uh, its literal meaning uh, is uh, al-kaf, to, to hold something back, to restrain something. And so fasting is about restraint. Fasting is about holding back, which is why we hold ourselves back from food and drink and, and, and a number of other prohibited things. The Prophet ﷺ explained, لِكُلِّ عِبَادَةٍ بَاب وَبَابُ الْعِبَادَةِ أَسْسَوْمُ Every act of worship, every worship has a door through which you enter. And the door of all ibadah is psalm. The door through which you enter into worship of Allah in the first place is fasting. Because to begin to worship Allah, you first need to separate yourself from everything else. In other words, there's a principle, there's a legal principle in, in Islamic law that to repel harm, to repel evil, takes priority over acquiring goods. To repel evil takes priority over acquiring goods. In other words, before you can turn to Allah, you have to remove the world from yourself. You have to remove your dependence on the world from, from yourself. You have to empty the cup of your soul, as it were, before it can be filled. So before you can begin truly in, in, in ibadah, you need to do a takbiratul ihram, you need to throw the world behind you. And so this is that throwing of the world behind you. This is what fasting is. It's throwing the world behind you. It's detaching your dependence on the world. It's letting your soul rise out of the body. Because the more that, the more that you eat, after you eat, you feel tired. And you, uh, you know, especially if you, if you overeat, you'll end up in a food coma, you want to sleep. Why? Because what the soul is down digesting the food. The science, the, um, uh, the um, what, what you learn in science of, of anatomy and biology and how all the systems work is describing how the soul is digesting the food. But what scientists can't infer is the existence of the soul in the first place. Because it's not material, it's not something that can be uh, sensed through instruments. And so it's the soul digesting the food. And so it's already occupied, it's engaged with the body. And so it's not free to look towards the angelic realm. And the human being is a mixture of soul and body. The body is from this realm, the body is from the earth, and the soul is from the angelic realm. So long as as the soul is looking down at the body, so long as the soul is engaged with the body, it can't be looking up. Just like if I look down right now, I can't see, see what's above me. And if I'm looking up, I'm not looking down. If the soul's gaze is upwards, it can't be looking downwards. If the soul's gaze is downwards, it can't be looking upwards. If you're eating, in, uh, uh, then, there, um, then you're and you're digesting, then the soul is occupied in that. And so when we say that the soul is kef, is to restrain yourself, 
is restraining your dependence on the body in order to free the soul. In order to free the soul. That's what tattaqun means in the ayah. In other words, when the body is weakened, the soul is strengthened. As a khulasa of what we're saying. When the uh, body is weakened, the soul is strengthened. I, I want to qualify that though. Um, you know, there's when it comes to religion, you often have two types of people. One type is are the reluctant followers of a religion who generally want the rulings of religion to be very permissive and just want to do what they want to do. They just want to follow uh, their own whims and desires and whatever. But oftentimes when a person uh, takes on the label of being religious, they move from one extreme to the other extreme. So they go from extremely permissive to extremely strict on themselves. And so this idea of rigidness, of strictness, this idea of um, making things hard on the self becomes something that they, they desire, which itself is, is not religion. Religion is in the middle of both of these. And so when they hear something like this, that when the body is weakened, then the soul is strengthened, then they'll go to, to the opposite extreme. Okay, fine. Let me fast all the time. Let me never eat anything. Let me completely exhaust myself. And then my soul will be strengthened. And you see this historically um, in medieval Christianity, especially um, monasticism embodied this extreme, uh, 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 not ideal, but this extreme view that um, we should be complete ascetics. We should completely divorce ourselves from, from the body. That the flesh and, and material and the world is, is completely hateful, it's loathsome. It's not something that Allah has blessed in a way. And so they, they tried to deny themselves the body. They never got married, they never ate, they lived completely separate from, uh, from uh, society. That leads to another extreme. This extreme is also dangerous. And the danger of that is just like when you overeat, your soul becomes engaged with the body and can't think, you can't uh, work, you can't uh, read Quran, actually reflect on, uh, on the meanings of the Quran. On the other hand, if the body is too weak, then can you think about anything? Can you, can you worship? No. Because the soul is now occupied with the absence because the soul can't be completely separated from, from the body. And so now it feels hunger and it's starving, and the soul is entirely focused on the body needs something, the body needs something. But at the same time, this person who's, obs who's obsessed with this rig rigidity and strictness in, in, in religion, he will think, well, oh, it's, it's fine, this is what I need to do to divest myself of, of the body. And so neither actually serves its purpose. Each one re results in a different... Um, uh, each one fails its purpose because in either case the soul is going to be occupied with the body itself. It won't be free to look upwards, to gaze at Allah, to understand what Allah is telling us in the Quran and the Sunnah and so on and so forth. This is basically, um, you know, uh, a lot of this is um, part of ancient wisdom as well. Uh, Plato famously said um, while, while debating um, the people that he debated, the difference between me and you is that you live to eat and I eat to live. What do you mean eat to live? Because life isn't about, about eating. Life isn't about just enjoying food and enjoying material de desires. There's a higher purpose to life. And eating it should be done to the degree that's necessary to enjoy the other parts of life, to fulfill the other purposes of life. Um, when someone overstuffs themselves with the material, it numbs the soul. When we're going to talk about, okay, what does it mean for the soul to look upwards versus to look downwards? The, an excessive uh, engagement with the material world numbs the soul. Because the soul is a sixth sense. It's like we have eyes and ears and, um, and touch and smell and and so on and so forth. The soul is a sixth sense. It's another way of perceiving the world. If you hear something too loud, you become deafened and you can't hear soft sounds. If you see something too bright, 
then you're unable to see soft lights, soft colors. You become blind. Um, if you taste something too strong, you're, you can't taste uh, subtle tastes anymore. And so, um, you know, in, in the same way that, for example, if you if someone eats candy all the time or is used to very extreme strong strong flavors, are they going to enjoy apples or fruits or things with just just a small amount of, amount of sugar in them? No, because their senses are numb; they're desensitized. Soma is about resensitizing the soul because the spiritual world is made of of what are called lapaif these ethereal, subtle realities, like light, like smoke. They're not things that are easily grasped, they're not solid. And so the more that you become sensitized to these things, the more you're able to understand it. And the more that you're able to understand it, then you can fulfill the purposes of, of religion. Then you understand what Allah is trying to tell you in the Quran and the Sunnah. Then you understand what, the perp what it means for there to be angels around you, and then you can actually see them. And you understand what their purpose is and how they uh, benefit your uh, your life. Um, uh, Allah says uh, in in the Quran, "You read Allah bikum yusr, wa la yuridu bikum asr." Allah intends ease for you; He doesn't intend difficulty for you. And that's a summation of what Soma is. Soma is about easing life for you, making it better for you. Allah intends ease for you. This verse de doesn't mean that whatever I find easy, I'll do because that's only what God wants. And if I find fasting difficult, then let me just take a day off because I'm working today all day and it's, it's, it's too hard for me. What the verse is saying is what Allah has intended for you, in other words, what he's decreed for you already, know that that's already in your best interest. Know that that's already ease for you, even if you can't see it. Even if you think ease is somewhere else, even if you think that, oh, this is so difficult right now, this is uh, so weighty right now. What Allah is showing you is the full scope, the full consequences of your action, not just the immediate um, uh, feeling that, you're, uh, that you do from whatever action that you're doing. Um, the, this ayah that, that I just quoted, comes at the end of the ayah on Ramadan. And that's why, and that's how you know that it's, it's connected. Um, because Allah says, Shahr Ramadan, Alladhi unzila fihi al-Quran, hudan lil nas wa bayinati min al-huda wa al-furqan, fa man shahira min kum al-shahra fal yasum, wa man kana muraydan aw ala safran fa iddatum min ayyam al-ukhar, yuridu Allahu bikum al-yusra wa la yuridu bikum al-usr. So here Allah uh, encompasses the entire purpose of the fast, as well as certain, he, he tells you certain things, uh, certain secrets, certain wisdoms about the fast. He says, the month of Ramadan in which the Quran was revealed as a guidance for people. And clear evidence in that guidance. And a criterion. What a criterion is, is is that in life, oftentimes traveling, navigating through, through life, uh, thinking about different possibilities of what might happen to you and making uh, large, large decisions in life can seem like navigating through, through darkness. And Allah describes this in the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah, that there are people who go through life in complete, dar uh, uh, in complete uh, darkness. They don't know, they're not, uh, they take one step and they think that, that they see a light, a, a flash of lightning, and it illuminates the path that, that, that they're supposed to continue on. And they continue one step, and then the flash of lightning goes away. There's no continuous light for them. This is the example, this is the pattern of the hypocrites. But the believer, Allah describes as, a woman kana, uh, a woman kana, a Muslim woman, uh, so Allah describes uh, there are people that uh, oh, that were you not dead and God gave you life. 
In other words, were you not dead of spirit? Death is when the soul leaves you and you become just body, just a material body. Were you not dead and God gave you life again? He returned your ruh to you. If you're blind, if you're deaf, if you can't taste anything, it's as if you have no soul at all. The soul has become completely succumbed to the body. The soul has become completely dependent and subservient to the body. And so the soul is effectively dead. Psalm gives it life again. Fasting gives it life again. Fasting gives you the ability to come out of your body again. Were you not um, dead and then we gave you life? Or, or was he not dead and then he, Allah, gave you life? And he gave for you a light, and this is one of the meanings of Furqan, a light by which you walk amongst people. Give you a light by which you walk amongst people. This is the light of wisdom. And knowledge of understanding that in the darkness of life, when you don't know what you're doing, when things seem confusing, or when things um, are not clear, you have a guidance. Not just a guidance of, okay, let me look in the Quran and, and see if there's any guidance uh, for me, but there's intuitive knowledge that the believer has, someone who's, uh, who's practicing his faith to, to the fullest. He has intuitive knowledge of what does God desire from me in every moment. And he recognizes that whatever God desires from me is already in my best interests. You read Allahu Bikmul Yusr, Allah desires ease for you. And so he gives you this light, and suddenly it's all clear. Suddenly it all makes sense. Suddenly, questions of like the problem of evil, why did God allow suffering in the world, isn't a question anymore. It's clear to you now. Why? Why are the people in Gaza suffering so so severely after so many decades of 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 resistance, oh, there's a plan behind this. Suddenly all the vicissitudes of life that make us feel like you're drowning in an ocean, they make sense to you. You understand what Allah desires, what Allah is intending from his plan. This is the light that, um, this is the light, this is the furqan that Ramadan brings to the believer. And then, and then Allah describes, so whoever uh, sees the moon, then let him fast for the month. Uh, and whoever is, is sickly or, or on a journey, then let him complete that portion from other days. Allah intends ease for you and does not intend difficulty for, for you. And then he continues, and he intends for you to complete the number, complete the number of days. Because there is a wisdom in, in fasting 29 or 30 days uh, specifically, which sort of gets into um, uh, the uh, Arabic numbers and letters and things like that. Um, which is a bit complicated to explain right now. But there's a wisdom in fasting 29 or 30 sp uh, specifically. And so even if you miss some days, Allah obligates on you 29 or 30 because that's the completion of Ramadan. And for you to glorify Allah for what he guided you to. What did he say at the beginning of the ayah? That the Quran was a guidance for mankind. In other words, this is also the month of the Qur'an. In, in reading the Qur'an, you will gain what you need for light in this life. And when you gain it, then you will glorify Allah for that wisdom, for that understanding that you gained that you didn't have before, for clearing all that confusion from you. And that you might be grateful for what Allah gave to you. Uh, now, part of um, um, part of what we gain gratitude from in Ramadan is realizing that um, is realizing our dependence on on Allah, and that our dependence on, on Allah, our sole dependence on Allah, frees us from our dependence on other things. Something you often hear repeated over and over again is that, well, especially when talking to non-Muslims, they'll ask, why do, why do you fast? And we say, well, we fast in order to feel solidarity with, with, with the poor, with the miskeen, which is true, um, but it doesn't really get at, at the heart of, of what's going on. A, somebody who's poor will fast every day, like um, uh, there's a... There's a man, a sheikh, Sheikh Fal, in, 
in Medina who we met from from Mauritania. Um, he lives essentially in a room maybe the size of this, maybe twice the size of this platform, that's it. In, uh, in the poorest conditions you can, you can imagine. Um, he, hasn't, uh, he hasn't received new things until recently for decades. It, it looks like a place, it looks like the home of the homeless, except that he literally just has a building, a room in which he lives. But otherwise you would consider him, him homeless. He fasts every day. Um, fast because he doesn't have food otherwise. All the, all the food that he gets is from food that people bring him in the mushroom and then oftentimes he distributes the extra food. He doesn't keep it for himself. That sort of a person, he's miskin. So when we say we feel solidarity with him during fasting, yes, you feel solidarity with him. But his state is all of our states in reality. His outward state is always being in need of Allah. He doesn't, know, he doesn't know where his next meal is going to come from. He doesn't know if he's going to have food tonight. He doesn't know what, what he's going to eat. All he does is go to the masjid and worship, and his risk comes to him as Allah intends. And that's the reality for all of us. The only difference is we, it appears to us that we have means. It appears to us that things happen uh, because we gain a paycheck and that paycheck pays for our food and then somebody cooks our food and we go to the grocery store or we go to a restaurant and that all these means are what's giving us sustenance and that you know if if the food isn't cooked uh, one night then you'll get angry at, at the person who is who, who is supposed to, to cook it or if you don't get your paycheck then you start worrying about okay how am I gonna feed myself how am I going to live how is my family going go, go, going to live all of that worry about risk all of that worry about uh, where's my sustenance where's my food where's my housing going go, go, going to, to come from because we don't realize we're miskin in the first place we are, we are in the same state as a Sheikh Fat. Just his outward matches his inward, and our outward deceives us from our inward reality. Um, the great sage uh, Ibn Atala Sekandari says, Your dependence is intrinsic, is essential to you. It's what makes you human, your dependence on Allah. And so we are grateful to him, that, and we're grateful to Allah that he made us dependent on him because we don't need the food. We don't need the drink in, in reality. When you, uh, outside of, of, of Ramadan, if you miss a meal, you really start worrying, oh no, where's, oh, where's my food going to, go, going to come from? I'm hungry, I have to eat, I have to eat, I have to go somewhere, I have to figure out what, what, what I'm, going, I'm going to do. Same thing in, in, in Ramadan during, during lunchtime. There's no worry. There's no worry. You don't need the food in the first place. It's just an illusion. And so this month is revealing that reality, that you're free of need of these, of these things in the world. And that at, uh, your, uh, your only dependence is on Allah. You know, at, alhamdulillah, you, you realize you're, you're not dependent on people. People aren't as merciful as Allah is. People can be nice, people can have uh, good, good characters, some of them at least. But you realize oftentimes in difficult times, or if they're in, in difficult times, then very few people really retain those, those uh, good qualities. Very few people remain generous, very few people remain... Uh, honest, very few people r remain trustworthy when their luck is down, when the world seems seems uh, against them. Those are not the t type of people you want to 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 depend on. You want to depend on the person, on He Allah, who is without need, on the person whose uh, wealth is plentiful, who has everything, and so he can give azawajal freely without any fear of poverty. And so this is one of his attributes, right? In, in a hadith, the Prophet says, uh, but it's a, a hadith Qudzi, so it's said on the divine tongue. He says, 
fasting is mine. Allah says, fasting is mine and I reward it. Everything else that we do is not ascribed to Allah. What does it mean fasting is mine? Because all things go back to Allah. And they don't go back to Allah in the sense of it benefiting it, benefiting him or harming him. They go back to Allah in the sense that they're accepted or not accepted by, by Allah. So what does it mean fasting is mine? What Allah is telling us is fasting is an attribute of mine. I fast just as you fast. Except the fasting of Allah is eternal. The fasting of Allah is everlasting. Because he doesn't need food or drink, and that's what fasting is. It's the lack of dependence on the world. And Allah does not depend on the world. He fasts, and so he graces us with, with this ability to acquire his attribute, to become like him in a way. Not, you know, not anthropomorphically, but in, in a figurative way, to become like him. Just as he is without need of food or drink, he uh, allows us to be without food or drink, by us depending on him and not depending on the food or drink in the first place. You gain, in other words, you gain self-sufficiency, which is what, what we've been talking about, what fasting really is. Fasting is self-sufficiency. You gain self-sufficiency by him sufficing you. And so you are self-sufficient of the food, you're self-sufficient of the material world, you're self-sufficient of other people, you're self-sufficient of their opinions and what they will do to you and whether they are acting in your interest or not acting in your interest and so on and so forth. Um, no. Any questions or anything? I think it's probably close to the break time, 4.30. Yeah. Four o'clock. Oh, never mind. We still have time. Okay. The uh, so um, that's the that's about the purpose of a fasting. What does it mean? What is what? What's the significance of it? How does it tie to um, how it affects the soul and the body? Um, and why has Allah decreed it and prescribed it for us in the first place? Um, but to implement this means, like we said at the beginning, that we don't treat uh, fasting as just a, an exercise in fulfilling our obligations and then we're done with it at, at Maghrib time. Uh, the, to achieve um, a lot of these things that we're talking about means that you begin fasting, not just a minimum fast, but a little bit more, the way that the Salaf al Saleh uh, and the Salihin um, would fast. And their fasting included more than just the bare minimum. And so there's some practices that are recommended. So I wanted to read a little bit um, from one of my teacher's books, Shaykh Abdul Rahman Hafidahullah, on what those practices were and how to achieve this self sufficiency and this lack of dependence and this restraining of the self and of the ego so that the soul might be free. So Bismillah. He says here, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salam, ala sayyidu wa mursaleen, sayyidu Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salam. Qala al-Musannif, hafidhullahu ta'ala wa naf'ana Allahu bihi wa bikum fiddarini, ameen. Wa amma al-sawm al-khusus, wa huwa al-sawm al-salihin, fa huwa kafu al-jawarihi, an al-athan wa tamamuhu bi sittati umur. So, so there's six practices um, uh, amongst the fasting of the righteous, meaning people, uh, the righteous isn't just a word for people who outwardly display the signs and marks of piety. The righteous are those who live Islam to the fullest, who gain, who gain the fruits of Islam along with just this practice. And so the first one, al-awwalu, غض البصر وكفه عن الاتساع في النظر إلى كل ما يضم ويكره وإلى كل ما يشغل القلب ويهني عن ذكر الله عز وجل. The first is to lower the gaze and to restrain it from peering out onto uh, towards everything that is 
uh, blameworthy and everything that's, that is disliked. So not only restraining your gaze um, from, from the haram, but also from things that are disliked and displeasing to Allah Azza the um, what comes into the eye, the eye and the ears, all of these limbs of of the of, of the body, are uh, entry routes into the heart or entry routes into the soul. And so the soul sees through all of these uh, uh, faculties on the human body. And so whatever comes into it. If it's, if it's displeasing to, to Allah, it's, it, it's, it's because it harms the soul. And so whatever is, is, is disliked, whenever you see it, you become affected by it. Whenever uh, um, there's a principle in, in philosophy that whenever something is known, the intellect takes on a shape. In other words, when you are thinking about a book, let's say, then there is the appearance, there is a likeness of a book in the mind. Right? When you're seeing, just, just like when you're seeing something with your eyesight, in the back of the eyeball, there's an image that's, that's reflected of the object that you're seeing. Similarly, in the soul, whenever something is known, un, its image is cast onto the back of the soul. And so it takes on that shape, it takes on that image, and is affected uh, uh, by it. Whenever the soul becomes, sees something, it becomes aware of it, it becomes familiar with it. And so the more that, that you see things that are harmful to, uh, to yourself, the more it becomes normalized to you. For example, if you um, scroll through YouTube all day, and your um, um, YouTube or or other things, and the stream of, and the video the uh, the video feed that you have is all is is is, is full of um, uh, images of different things that are disliked or calling you to follow your desires or follow your your lusts. Then that that idea becomes normalized for you. It's not as despicable. It's not some. It's not something that you immediately recoil from, or like, oh, that's disgusting. That's not something I want to do. Why? Because the soul has become normalized to it. It's seen it over and over and over again until it just becomes the habit of the soul. This is why the Prophet ﷺ said, "Another to sahman masmuman min sihami iblis la a single glance is a poisoned arrow from the bow of, sh of shaitan, from the bow of Iblis. So whoever leaves that gaze of something he wants to, to, to look at, but he knows is uh, displeasing to, to Allah, whoever leaves it out of fear of Allah, Allah rewards him, Allah gives him faith, he, and he finds the sweetness of that faith in his heart. He finds the benefit of that faith. It's not just uh, blind faith. It's faith where you see why, uh, you see the beauty of that faith. You feel, you taste the fruits of that faith. You gain that light, that furqan that we were speaking of. So that's the first practice to restrain your gaze from things that are displeasing to Allah Azza wa Jal. The second one he says, Athani, Hifthul Lisan and Hadayan, Wal Kadibi, Wal Ghibati, Wal Namimati, Wal Fash, Wal Jafai, Wal Khusumati, Wal Mira, Wal Ilzamu Sukud. So the second is, uh, is holding the tongue back from uh, empty speech, from lying, from backbiting, from spreading tales and gossiping, uh, from speaking about uh, immoral and, de and indecent things from speaking harshly, from argumentation and husuma and mira are both argumentation really. So holding the tongue back from these things uh, and forcing upon it silence, forcing it to keep quiet. 
Because when you're talking, you're engaged with the thoughts in your mind. The soul is occupied with trying to think about what should I talk about? How, 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 do, I, uh, how do I make myself look... Uh, um, you know, how do I make myself sound funny to, to, to the other person? How do I impress the person that I'm talking to? How do I tell the story well, etc.? Your mind is occupied with that. In other words, your heart and your soul are, are occupied with that. And when you're in that state, when you're always talking about things that aren't of, of any benefit or are, are harmful to people like, uh, like riba and gossip and so on and so forth, you're not in a state of dhikr. You're not in a state of remembrance. And so the silence serves the purpose of وَشُغْلُهُ بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى وَتِلَاوَةِ الْقُرْآنِ uh, it serves a purpose of when you're, when the tongue is silent, then the heart can reflect on Allah, can remember Allah, can invoke Allah, and can recite the Quran with true understanding, with true presence of heart. And he says, فَهَذَا سَوْمُ lisan. This is the fasting of the tongue, fasting of the tongue from these um, sins of the tongue. Uh, and again, there's a hadith narrated about this in the Masum Jannah. فَإِذَا كَانَ أَحَدُكُمْ صَائِمًا فَلَا يَرْفُثْ وَلَا يَجْهَلْ وَإِنِ مِنْ قَاتَلْهُ أَوْ شَتَمُهُ فَلْيَكُلْ إِنِّي صَائِمْ إِنِّي صَائِمْ It's recommended uh, that whenever somebody's in insulted uh, or, s or a person tries to fight with him while you're fasting, what do you say? I'm fasting. I'm fasting. I'm not going to respond to you. Because fasting is the shield. And so you're supposed to protect yourself from your own ego. Like we said, the other person who's fighting you, the other person who's, who's, who's insulting you, he in reality has no effect. He's just an illusion. He's, Allah has placed him there to test you. You don't need to respond to that person. What you need to do is protect your ego from speaking because you're in a state of remembering Allah. And you want to stay in that state of remembering Allah and not coming to the place of, of defending yourself. It's also um, uh, narrated from the Prophet Sallallahu that um, when a person is, is insulted and, uh, and remains silent, that the angels instead defend him. So he receives protection. It's not just, you know, he exposes himself to, uh, you know, or, I'm not recommending that people be doormats and not say anything when, um, uh, um, when they're attacked. But the point being that uh, there, uh, there's, there's a higher purpose to it, and it shouldn't be ego-serving. So that's the second. The first one is restraining the tongue, restraining the uh, the eyes. The second one is restraining the tongue. The third one. كَفَّ السَّمْعِ أَنْ إِسْغَاءَ إِلَى إِلَى كُلِّ مَا إِلَى كُلِّ مَكْرُوهٍ لِأَنَّ كُلَّ مَا حَرَمَ قَوْلُهُ حَرَمَ إِسْغَاءَهُ إِلَيْهِ وَلِذَلِكَ سَوَّى اللَّهُ تَعَالَى بَيْنَ الْمُسْتَمِعِ وَأَكِلِ السُّحْتِ فَقَالَ تَعَالَى سَمَعُونَ لِلْكَذِبِ وَأَكَالُونَ لِلسُّحْتِ The third one is restraining or the fasting of the of the ears, restraining the ears, restraining your hearing from listening to. Everything that is disliked, so everything that we said with, with regards to eyesight also applies here. Just like the eyes should not extend towards that which is, which is displeasing to Allah, the ears should not lend themselves to, any, to listening to anything that is displeasing to Allah. And with the tongue, just like there are things that are, uh, uh, that are sins of the tongue that a person is forbidden from saying, like, uh, backbiting, like gossip, and so on and so forth. It's also haram to listen to, to, to these things. Everything that is haram to say is haram to listen to. And so the two are equivalent. And they're uh, considered equivalent in the Quran, in the ayah that, uh, that is, is stated. Um, additionally, we know uh, with... Uh, um, with, uh, not with gossiping, with backbiting. If somebody is saying something about their fellow believer that uh, the person would not like, that's backbiting. Being silent in the face of backbiting is haram just as, as badly as uh, the backbiting itself. 
Allah says in the Quran, فَلَا تَقْعُدُوا مَعْهُمْ حَتَّى يَخُودُوا فِي حَدِيثٍ غَيْرِهِ إِنَّكُمْ إِذَا مِثْلُهُمْ He says in the context of somebody who, who, who's backbiting, then don't sit with them until they delve into some other topic of, of conversation. If you were to sit with them, then you would be just like them. Right? The... Um, um, the uh, uh, backbiting riba, we all know, is like eating the flesh of your of your brother. Not just the person who's saying it, but the person who's listening to, to it as well. You have to leave that uh, place of dining, as it were. You need to leave the room, or you need to say something to uh, uh, to stop the riba from continuing. So those are three. It sounds like the adhan's going off. So inshallah, we'll pray and then come back. And then there's just uh, three more after that, inshallah. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina Mursaleen Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Bismillah. So to continue, we were talking about the, um, the fasting of the righteous and that the fasting of the righteous revolves around guarding the inroads to the heart, guarding the inroads to, to the soul. Because the point of fasting isn't just uh, getting hungry uh, or getting thirsty. The point of fasting is to free the soul. And to, and to free the soul, oh, it needs to be divested from and separated from the, the material world and from engagement with the material world so that it can and learn, learn to uh, uh, Engage with Allah, engage with these spiritual lataif, um, these ethereal matters that um, uh, that its soul is intended for. And the inroads to the heart are the different limbs and the senses uh, and faculties of the human body. And so we talked first about eyesight and guarding eyesight. The second one was uh, guarding the tongue. Third one was guarding uh, the ears. The fourth one here, he says, Bismillah. Rabbah kafu baqiyat al jawarihi an al athami min al yadi wa rijli wa an al makarih wa kaf al batni an al shubhati waqt al iftar. Fala ma'na al sum wa huwa kafu an al atam al halal tham al iftar wa an al haram. He continues, he says, the fourth, okay, is to restrain all of the other uh, limbs. Uh, and so the, this includes your hands, your feet. Uh, your tongue, your eyes, your ears, your stomach, and your genitals. Uh, restraining all of those from uh, things that are displeasing to Allah, whether or not they're haram or whether they're just simply uh, mildly disliked. What this means, though, for the stomach is obviously you're not eating. But this kaf, the song, continues at the time of iftar. At the time of, of iftar, you're allowed halal foods. But you still have a psalm from haram foods, as well as a psalm from foods that are doubtful. And so, uh, in these days, it'd be, uh, you know, meat that's not properly slaughtered. Um, uh, it would include food if, if somebody has a profession or, or a job that... Um, is not valid and allowed by, by, by Islamic law, then the food that you're eating, uh, if it's from that risk, uh, then that would also be considered uh, food that is doubtful. Those doubtful things, a person should also restrain himself from at the time of, of iftar. Because it's pointless to fast from the halal and then, and then to engage in the haram later on. Right? It's like somebody who... Uh, uh, who's somebody who's, who's mildly sick, so he takes some medicine during the day, and then at night he says, okay, I've, I've had my medicine, but let me enjoy this, po this poison because it tastes so good. You're just going get you, to get, you, get yourself sicker. And, well, and, and a lot of people end up, end up doing this. Uh, at the time of iftar, they'll have a feast, that's more than they would have eaten otherwise throughout the day. So what's the point? If the idea is, is that the soul 
uh, should be disentangled, uh, should not be so preoccupied with bodily needs, then there's no point uh, spending half the day not eating and then spending the entire night digesting the food from, from iftar and you have no time to read the Quran, no time to pray tarawih because those are times that the soul is now freed because it hasn't been, been, it been eating all day. That's the time you can take advantage of what you gain during the day at night. So, so if you have iftar, just eat enough to, to, to satisfy your, your hunger and eat enough at the beginning of the fast that you aren't entirely depleted throughout, throughout the entire day. Anything more than that, you've, you've missed the entire point of the previous day's fast. The night is when you take advantage of what happened during, during the day. Um, the Prophet ﷺ said, uh, how, many, how many people fast and yet they gain nothing from the fast except hunger and thirst? Because they miss the point of the fast. They eat too much after the fast. And so scholars say this is somebody who um, eats the haram, uh, somebody who, uh, who breaks his fast on the flesh of his brother by riba, by backbiting or as somebody who eats excessively uh, at the time of, of iftar. Um, and um, he says here, وَكَيْفَ يُجْتَفَادُ مِنَ السَّوْمِ كَحْرُ عَدُوِ اللَّهِ وَكَسْرُ الشَّهْوَةِ إِذَا تَدَارَكَ السَّعِمُ عِنْدَ فِطْرِهِ مَا فَاتَهُ صَحْوَةَ نَهَارِهِ وَرُبَّمَا يَزِيدُ عَلَيْهِ فِي, في أَلْوَانِ الطَّعَامِ which is essentially what, what uh, I was just saying. He, he says, how can he gain from the fast um, controlling and mastering this enemy of God, the enemy of God being his own ego, and to break his desires, to break the control that his desires have over him. If he make, if the person who's fasting makes up when he breaks his fast, what he lost in the middle of the day. And then he says, and a person might even exceed what he would, what he would have eaten otherwise. He might exceed it in terms of the variety of foods that, that, that he would eat. And, and so he talks about his time uh, that has become the habit of people to uh, store up all sorts of, of, of food and types of food specifically for Ramadan. They only eat pakora during Ramadan. They have specific foods for Ramadan just to enjoy that time. Uh, and so he'll eat in one month what he won't eat in many, many months. So people gain uh, weight during Ramadan rather than losing weight during Ramadan. Even though it's known that the purpose of, of fasting is to empty the self and to break uh, the desires so that the soul is strengthened uh, uh, in its ability to have piety. So he says, فَالْرُوحُ الصَّوْمُ وَسِرُّهُ تَضَعِيفُ الْقُوَىٰ أَلَّذِي هِيَ وَسَائِلُ الشَّيْطَانِ إِلَّا الْقَوْدِ إِلَى الشُّرُورِ he says the spirit, the essence, the point of fasting and its secret, secret meaning, why did Allah legislate this in the first place? Its secret is to weaken the faculties of the body. The faculties of the body that are the inroads of shaitan into the heart. Right? It's said that in Ramadan, shaitan is imprisoned. He is uh, confined. Not just literally confined, but he's confined because he can't enter into the... Uh, he, he has his own song. He has his own kaf, right? His own restraint. He's restrained. He's restrained by your fasting. You restrain him because shaitan only acts on you through your eyes, through your ears, through your food, through your stomach. But if all of those have been protected through these practices that, uh, that we're talking about, then shaitan has no inroad to you. He has no ability to affect you. And someone who practices this during Ramadan then is able to practice outside of Ramadan. He's gained a shield. He's gained a taqwa, 
taqwa is a shield, like we mentioned in the beginning. He's gained a shield from, from, from the shaitan outside of, of, of Ramadan by practicing it in Ramadan as well. So these inroads that, that shaitan has, they're all weakened. Uh, inroads of, of shaitan to drive the human being to evil. This only happens uh, by lessening the amount of food that you eat overall. Um, yeah, and then uh, Imam Sharani uh, he mentions that what does it mean to diminish your food? It means that you should feel a hunger in excess of what you normally feel. Meaning, meaning there's a normal type of hunger that we all feel throughout the day, uh, just between meals. If that's the only hunger that you're feeling, then your soul isn't isn't being separated from the body any more than it normally would. Hunger is, a, hunger is a sign that the ego is being forced to separate itself. And so you, so you should feel a little bit, a little bit more hungry than, than you normally do. It's a good sign that your ego is being restrained. Um, hmm. There were um, some of the Salahin of the past. I'm, I'm not recommending this for people, but just to understand where uh, the heights that a Muslim can, can go to in fasting, realizing what those heights, what those ideals are, can be motivating. Uh, you know, Sharani says, he heard from his teacher, Sayyidi Ali Ali al Khawas, rahimahullah, say that uh, the person doing, uh, during suhoor, he would recommend to his students uh, that he not exceed three bites. Or three dates for uh, uh, for suhoor, and similarly, uh, when breaking the fast, just just three dates, and that's how they, and that's how they would spend the entirety of the Ramadan. Now, so uh, those are five practices. The uh, sixth one is to recognize that despite everything that that we have done, uh, fasting. Is something that belongs to Allah, as we said, asomuli wan adzibi. But we don't know if it's accepted or not. So even during uh, during iftar, the heart should 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 remain, as he says here, ma'allak multariban bain al khofi wa raja. It should be suspended between hope and fear. In one sense, hopeful of Allah's mercy, they will accept this fast despite the shortcomings in the fast, but fearful of what if I've just wasted my day? What if I haven't done enough? Because that fear will drive him to improve himself. And, um, uh, and he should be in the state at the end of every ibadah that he finishes. Um, uh, like it's uh, often been, been repeated, when you finish praying, you say Astaghfirullah because of the same idea. Astaghfirullah because you're in a state of fear. Maybe, maybe I prayed, but the way I prayed wasn't pleasing to Allah, and so He didn't, he didn't, he didn't accept it. So this is the Astaghfirullah. Astaghfirullah comes from that fear of recognizing that perhaps uh, what I've done has not been accepted by my Lord. Um, and then he talks about um, here the meaning of psalm being one of the attributes of Allah. So we'll just read it. Qal um, al-Imam Sha'rani radiallahu anhu As-salm al-wasfun min usaf al-rububiyya la yatasufu bihi illa al-kamili ala al-kamali illa allahu alladhi yut'imu wa la yut'am كما قال في الحديث القدسي أتصوم لي وأنا أجزي به فأضافه إلى نفسه أي لا يتصف به, به أحد إلا الله لأنه الغني عن الأكل أبد العابدين ودهر الداهرين المنزه عن, عن جميع الأغراض الشهوات أزنا وأبدا He says Psalm is one of the traits is one of the names of Allah is one of the traits of his lordship Lordship meaning that Allah being a Lord is what makes us uh, an Abd. So it's one of his traits that makes him deserving of our worship. The fact that he is Sa'im, the, the fact that he 
a azawaja can be called fasting. And none are uh, none possess the trait of fasting in its perfection and its fullness, except for Allah, because He gives food, He feeds people, and He is not fed. As comes in the Hadith Qudsi, Som is mine, fasting is mine, and I reward it. And so he, Azzawajal, ascribed this trait to himself. In other words, none are described by it. It doesn't apply to anyone in reality and in fullness except to Allah, Azzawajal, because he is free of needing to eat for all of time for and everlastingly. Transcendent uh, of all motives, transcendent of all desires, transcendent of all appetites uh, for all of time. فَفَرَضَ اللَّهُ الصَّوْمَ عَلَىٰ عِبَادِهِ كَسْرًا لِشَهَوَاتِ وَقَطْعًا لِأَسْبَابِ الْإِسْتِرْقَاكِ وَالتَّعَبُّدِ لِلْأَشْيَاءِ And so Allah obligates fasting upon His slaves to break their desires so that we become like Him in a way. Like we said, not anthropomorphically, but just like Allah does not have desires, He's transcendent, He rises above desire. He does this in His essence. We have to work towards this. And so He gives us fasting to break our, our desires and to cut off these causes of being enslaved and captive to things. To truly realize the meaning of being an abd for Allah alone. And not an abd to things. وَالصَّوْمُ يَقْطَعُ أَسْبَابَ التَّعَبُّرِ لِغَيْرِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى وَيُورِثُ الْحُرِّيَّةَ مِنَ الرَّقِّ لِلشَّهَوَاتِ وَالْمُشْتَهَيَاتِ لِأَنَّ الْمُرَادَ مِنَ الْإِنْسَانِ أَنْ يَكُونَ مَالِكًا لِلْأَشْيَاءِ وَخَلِيفَةً فِيهَا لَا أَنْ تَكُونَ مَالِكَةً لَهُ لِأَنَّهُ خَلِيفَةُ اللَّهِ فِي مُلْكِهِ Because the, uh, what is intended and desired from the human being, what Allah intends for us, is that we be masters of things and that we not be mastered and controlled by things. We are meant to be khulafa on this earth. We are meant to be vicegerent representatives of Allah on this earth. What that means is we should have mastery over things and that we should not be controlled by things. This is one of the things that uh, Allah has honored us with. لَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ We have ennobled the children of Adam with this status of khalifa the status of being a vicegerent, somebody who's responsible for the earth and representative of Allah on it. فَإِذَا كَانَ هَذَا سِرَّ الصَّوْمِ عِنْدَ أَرْبَابِ الْأَلْبَابِ وَأَصْحَابِ الْقُلُوبِ فَأَيُّ جَدْوَى لِتَأْخِيرِ أَكْلَةٍ وَجَمِعِ أَكْلَتَيْنِ عِنْدَ الْعِشَاءِ مَعَ الْإِنْهِمَاكِ فِي الشَّهَوَاتِ الْأُخَرِ طُولَ النَّهَارِ and so if this is the secret of fasting according to the masters of the heart and the possessors of of, of insight, then what point is there to delay eating one meal or two meals until the night time if one is fully engrossed in their, in their other desires for the entirety of the day? What have they done? They've missed the, the entire point. All they've come to, Allah with Allah, come to Allah with is this form, this empty box, without the purpose the purpose is to, come, is to come to Allah, is to serve Him in the manner that He asks us, us to serve Him, in the manner that's in our best interests. Not just to arbitrarily follow rulings because as a, we hope not to be punished and one day gain something in the afterlife. مَنْ لَمْ يَدَى قَوْلَ الزُّورِ وَالْعَمَلَ بِهِ فَلَيْسَ لِلَّهِ حَاجَةٌ the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever does not leave false speech and acting according to it, then Allah has no need for him to leave his food and to leave his fast. Allah never has need for us to leave our food and to leave our fast. But he, he, there's no point in him commanding us to leave our food and, and leave our fast. If the tongue is engrossed in these desires, in uh, speaking and in speaking falsehoods, in uh, spreading lies and rumors about people and gossiping, and so on and so forth. Qal Imam al-Baydawi, so the famous Mufassir, 
the famous scholar of Tafsir Imam Baydawi says, Laysa al maqsudu min shara'iyat al sawm nafs al ju'i wal atash. He says, it's not the point of the legislation of fasting to, uh, or uh, hunger and thirst is not, are not essentially the point and purpose of the legislation of fasting. Rather, what follows from the hunger and the thirst. The hunger and thirst are a means to breaking the desires. And by making this uh, uh, rebellious soul, and this nafs al-amara, compliant to a nafs al to the ruh, this peaceful soul, of which Allah Azza wa Jalla said, Ayya ayyatuhu nafs al irji'i ila rabbiki radiyatan maradiyya. O oh, pleasing soul, O oh, tranquil soul, return to your Lord, well pleased and well pleasing. You will be happy and Allah will be pleased with you. فَإِذَا لَمْ يَحْسَدْ ذَلِكَ لَا يَنْظُرُ اللَّهُ إِلَيْهِ نَظَرَ الْقَبُولِ If that does not occur, then Allah will not look upon his fast with the eye of acceptance. Um, I think we'll end there, inshallah. وَصَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَى سَيْدَ مُحَمَّدْ وَعَلَى أَلِهِ وَصَحْبِهِ وَسَلَّمْ May Allah um, uh, grant us the uh, understanding to uh, live this religion with purpose. May Allah um, uh, give us a, the strength to uh, fast with purpose, to fast for his sake, to fast um, uh, with the khalluq of, of his attribute of sum. May, may Allah accept from us our, our efforts. May Allah remind us as the days pass and, and as, as our memories fade, aid the purpose of what we are doing. May we be uh, people who separate ourselves from our desires and separate ourselves from the material world during the day and turn to Allah at night reading the Quran and remembering him during prayer so that we might gain light, that we might gain a furqan by which we travel this world in a manner that is both pleasing to us and pleasing to to him. Bijahi Sayyidina Muhammadan Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam through the practice and through the rank and through the pattern following our beloved example and model of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Bisaru Surat al Fatiha. Does anyone have questions about uh, anything or fasting? No. Go ahead. Yeah, there's uh, there, there's a number of ways of of understanding the hadith. Uh, the way I was explaining it was um, fasting is, is mine, just like Allah might say mercy is mine. It doesn't mean that there isn't mercy in the world. What it means is mercy is an attribute of mine. It's something I possess. It's something I give to people. When Allah says fasting is mine, He's saying this is something that belongs to me. Just like I am Ar-Rahman, I am also somebody who is free of need of food. And in being free of need, in need of food, I, I, uh, uh, I'm deserving of the name fasting, deserving of that trait of, of fasting. And accordingly, because it is mine, I reward it, uh, the understanding being with a special reward uh, that's innumerable and... Um, in Arabic, it's um, it's beyond understanding, essentially, of the mind. And so I I give it a special reward because uh, my abd, because my slave, has inculcated in himself an attribute that, in his fullness, belongs to me. I hope that helps, inshallah. Alhamdulillah. If there are no other questions, then we'll end there. Wassallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sallam. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.